problem. Uh, so uh, welcome, everyone. Let's go ahead and take attendance. Lisa, why don't you write, this, write it down? So you, myself, Melissa, anybody else on the call? I'm on the call, Debbie Sleek. Oh, Leo Litsky, thank you. Please for sure. being on the call. Hi, this is Julie from Kaufman. Okay, Julie, we'll talk in a minute when you do your report. Let me know what you think happened. I'm not sure why we're still having problems. I thought we had this yeah. under control, but I guess not. <laughs> mm. Anyone else on the call? Debbie, this is Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth Jose, excellent. Elizabeth is our assessment here at Archie Hendricks, and she was at the dinner meeting and the annual meeting in October, so that's awesome. Um, I was, I don't know, Lisa, have you heard anything from Teresa Holt as far as her being involved? Um, I know Teresa, she was off for a couple of months and is just coming back uh, into the saddle, so my guess is she's just kind of playing catch-up right now. Okay. All right. Um, hopefully, we'll reconnect with her. Um, I sent, Did everyone get a copy of the minutes from the annual meeting and the evaluation results? Did everyone at least get that? It should have been on the invite that you got from KAI. Did everyone get that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I think I put on there, um, i trying to remember where I put, I think it was on the minute that I put who was all at different things. Yeah, okay, so for our dinner meeting, we had 13 Unite members, which was great. And then I think everyone except we did not come to the meeting out here at Archie or... Um, I think everyone pretty much else did. So we had a we had a decent group. We probably had thirteen. We were missing. There were about six people who were scheduled to come to the dinner, um, who did not. So we I think we initially had like nineteen signed up, and I think six people didn't come like at the last minute. So we had thirteen. So okay, good. So we're gonna go ahead and um, follow our agenda. Is anybody else on the call? Okay. Let me just get to the um let me just get to the standing monthly agenda so we get that followed. Okay, so we have um we meet monthly on the third Thursday and if you notice the um invite was set for um uh right now I believe it's two o'clock on East Coast time, but in the spring, starting in March, it'll say three o'clock. So it'll always stay noon Arizona time. That's our goal is to just keep that time, okay? Um, any new members? It doesn't sound like we have any new members on the call. Um, any changes in contact information? Does anyone have any new contact information that should be updated? Okay. Julie, are we recording this call? Yes, we are. Julie, are we recording this call? Yes? Okay. Yes. So the, um, I don't think we recorded though the spirit call, right, from Monday, because you, you weren't on that call, so that probably didn't get recorded, right? We don't recall, we don't record the steering committee calls, only the monthly Unite calls. Only the monthly ones. Okay, good. Okay, so all business, I mean, basically we are, um, we do not have a guest speaker today. I did um, have some correspondence with Agnes. Is it Sweetster, Elizabeth, or Lisa, does that sound right? She's up in Alaska at the assisted living facility. Who is yes. it now? Agnes Sweetster. Sweetster, like, you know, like sweet and then sir, Sweetster. Yeah, okay. She she was, um, I had sent the information out from the web, some of the stuff on caregiver stress and things like that, and she responded how helpful it was and was kind of sharing some stories about her experiences. And I had asked her if she could be on the call, if she'd be willing to share those. But it doesn't sound like she's on the call, and hopefully she didn't try to call in and 
and just couldn't get through because I really um, was hoping that she would be on today's call. Um, Agnes Sweetster, she's at one of the assisted living facilities in Alaska, I believe. She's the manager, right? Uh, yes, she is. Okay, yeah. So she may she may be willing to speak on a future call. She sounded very interested in the night collaborative and wanted to be part of it. Um, so old business um, would basically be our um, annual meeting. And since Thank that you. was the last... Go ahead. Um, I, I forwarded the call-in number to Agnes, and hopefully she's at her desk and called in. Okay, uh, awesome. So because... Our last technical meeting was the annual meeting on Friday, October 20th. I'm just going to review. Um, we had some people attend by calling, which was Melissa, Julie, Tony, Curtis with KAI is no longer with KAI, so we'll be working with Julie Cunningham again. Jonathan Collins is still involved and Joseph Ray, so they all attended by phone. Um, in, in person, we had two of our board members. Um, Francis Down and Juana Casillas, and then Elizabeth Jose, who's on the call today, and Carly Clawson and Tammy Reed from Morningstar, who have been very engaged. Um, and then, of course, Keith Chartier from Health Service Advisory Group, our QIO in Phoenix. Uh, Ruth Tracy from Chin Lee. Unfortunately, the administrator was not able to come, but Ruth is like the director of nursing or acting DON. Uh, Ron Ross was here from Native Health, um, as well as Sue. Uh, Sheila Wiggins was here from Laguna Rainbow and brought two um, of her staff also. So I think we had a decent turnout. Um, the dinner was held at Casino del Sol in Tucson, and uh, I know several people attended the Banner Alzheimer's Institute 13th Annual Conference on Dementia and Native Americans. There were, I know that Carly... Uh, was very, very sick, unfortunately. If you hadn't heard that, she flew into Tucson and got very, very sick. So she missed part of the conference, but she was able to show up on Friday, which was good. Um, so, I mean, basically, you can all read through the minutes. I won't go through each point, but we were able, we had some welcoming remarks, and we did honor Kay Branch. So, Melissa, thank you for sharing that, because I'm not sure everyone really knows that connection. Um, the minute was recorded, um, and they will be on the CMS.gov website. We did go to the CMS website and kind of take a look at everything that's there. Um, you know, honestly, Julie, there, weren't, there wasn't any specific comments made about, I know you had asked for some feedback on the CMS website where we're housed. Um, I don't... I don't remember there being any specific um, information like saying, oh, I wish we did this instead of that. But I think it's good to have the logo, you know, there so it's consistent, you know, on the invites and that type of thing. I think we did want the logo on there. Um, Melissa Heflin gave us an update on traditional foods, um, which was good. I talked briefly about the grass. Melissa Jose talked a little bit about the ombudsman role, and she gave us an update on the QIOs. Um, since there's so much going on right now with the phase two. Um, KAI did an update and then Ron Ross spoke um, about their how they got their um, Medicaid reimbursement. And I just talked to him on the steering committee call on Monday. Um, and they I don't have his notes in front of me, um, sorry, but they did get Right, the week after he left here, um, they were able to get the the approval with the state uh, uh, state plan amended, and so they are. He said it's not. Lee, you might comment on this. I, I don't. This isn't. I'm not totally in, uh, clear on this. He said that instead of saying, "Oh, your reimbursement rate is going to be X per day, like 350 per day," he said it went on a cost basis. So they have to submit like a budget. To the state, and then the state, yeah, it's based on cost is what he told me, and maybe you could explain that, because I don't really understand it quite that well. What state is it, you know? Uh, it's, in, it's in Nebraska. 
they, they built that new nursing home in that corner of Nebraska rather than South Dakota. The only thing I can tell you to be honest is the state might be still operating on sort of a cost-based um, system where they haven't completed a document that outlines what your expenses are in each kind of category, but like a budget line item. And, and then it's calculated to see where it falls and then depending on where it falls and possibly even include acuity for patients um, would dictate reimbursement. But I, was, I didn't think any states were doing that anymore because it was so expensive. <laughs> so I'd have to hear more details to be with it. Yeah, maybe. I don't know if you have Ron Ross's contact, if you could, you know, find out, understand. You know, if, no, I don't. If you, if you email it to me, I'll email and ask. Okay, that'd be great, because you understand that better, and then you can just explain it to us in a little simpler language, because I don't quite, I'm not an expert in that. Um, I just want me to put for the minute, so I'm not sure exactly. Um, just put, um, Debbie will forward Ron Ross's contact to Leo Lisky. Uh, for uh, update on Glalis II um, state plan amendment. Because that was basically the gist of Ron's talk was, other than showing us pictures and talking about the work they had done, was to get state plans amended um, so that you could get a higher Medicaid reimbursement rate. And honestly, Lee, with everything that's going on, do, can you... I mean, I know you keep up on this, like with what's happening with the tax bill in Congress and some changes with the health care bill potentially. I mean, do you have any updates on for us on how that could affect what we're doing with tribal nursing homes? Um, only if there's a reduction in Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement. That would be okay. the most... Okay. No, right now, this stuff is so fluid, it's really hard to pin down. You know, the other day they threw in the back door um, an amendment that, that would repeal the... Um, part of the Affordable Care Act in the middle of the tax bill. So, I mean, you know, we're just going to have to wait a little longer until they flesh out some of this stuff and not in the Senate. We'll be in the Senate. Okay. 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 I say anything in writing, right. I'm sure do it that way also. Yeah. And, and by the way, Lee, anyone can join your blog, right? I do forward... Oh, yeah. That, that, for me. Or the, the list, or you don't have to join a blog. You can just log on to it, it's the list server that I, you have to join, I have to send a member thing. Okay, and how do they do that again? Just go to, what, what is your title? It's Lee at WIT, W-I-T, the number two, then T-U-C-S-O-N dot com. So it's Lee at WIT to Tucson dot com. Right. And so if you would email Lee, he can get you on his listserv, and he sends out all sorts of good stuff for tribes specifically. So it's all tribal-specific, which is really helpful. Um, I have forwarded some of these stuff to you. If, if it's not tribal-specific, there's a reason for it being included because it would have, could have an impact on tribal health or social services. Okay. 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 Um, is Joseph Ray on the call? Okay, sometimes he logs in late, uh, but he did talk a little bit at our annual meeting. Um, one of the things that this group um, needs to discuss, and we talked about it a little bit Monday at our steering committee, and I, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because it's new business, but I want to watch our time, um, is two things. One is we want to decide on where we're going to have our annual meeting by January, by our January meeting, because we want to get that information out. So people can really be planning on that at least nine months ahead of time. And it may look like a September one. Um, we did talk about um, working with NCAI um, or possibly NICOA, but some of those um, meetings are coming up in, like, September already. So we just want to get this nailed down already in January. Um, the other thing is um, we need to... Uh, what's the other thing? Right. Oh, we need to think about what topic, like, you know how the last couple of years, like two years ago, 2016, we kind of focused on traditional food. We've already agreed to do the long-term support service webinars, like we have the last three years um, with KAI, so we're going to be doing that again in May and July, like we did last year. But, the, so two years ago, we did them on traditional foods. We did a poster presentation on MCAI. Last year, we focused on... Um, um, uh, tribal relationships, you know, with, like, state legislative councils, things like that, boards, and we focused on dementia. 
there's nothing wrong with keeping those focuses, um, but we kind of had agreed to have, like, kind of a clinical and a non-clinical focus because, like, um, Q, um, Lisa brought up in our steering committee meeting, you know, for the QIOs to stay involved, I mean, they're all about not so much, you know, financial, but, uh, you know, they want to look at best practices and work with nursing homes to meet regulations and things like that. So we maybe one of our focuses would stay that way and the other one could branch out a little bit, like, you know, into financial. So if you look at the evaluation that was sent out um, with your invite, if everyone could just look at that for a minute, um, you'll see that some of the, the questions we asked on the evaluations, like what was has been most beneficial to you? A lot of people said, you know, networking with others. Um, you know, there was some, there was quite a bit of stuff actually on finances and information about finances and resources, um, supporting each other, um, you know, similarities that we all share and, and struggles that we all have. Um, there was some talk about topics for our next annual meeting listed there and some suggestions and locations for our next annual meeting, which we can take into account when we talk about that. Um, for the most part, everything was, was really positive. But there, we had done a little activity during the dinner meeting um, where we asked people to kind of list the key issues that come up for tribal nursing homes and then we swapped out cards and kind of rated them, prioritized them. And you just keep doing that and you kind of start to see a pattern. And I will say, if, if you look at that, I think I sent that document out with the invite, that it was very much um, planted toward, you know, sustainability of tribal nursing homes, you know, looking at, you know, funding sources and things like that. So that may be an area non-clinical that we might want to focus on in 2018. And one of the goals of that would be just to get more knowledge of that because I know that one long-term support service call that was held in September, um, Julie, what was that gal's name again? I forget. Um, Elena Seep. Yeah, and she's with, who is she with? Herself now. Um, yeah, she's with, on, I have a, uh, her own consulting group. Yeah, let's see. Oh, she's not, okay. She was, like, really good. I mean, I listened to that webinar, and, I mean, it was, I thought she did a great job really just explaining it. And I think sometimes just getting that information explained in that way, you know, because you can get a 300-page document, but it's like, you know, you don't really have time to look at that whole thing. So um, we may just want to keep that in mind. Um, Could you repeat that name again, please? Elena uh, Deep. How do you spell the last name? Probably like S E E P or S I E P. It's S. Okay, Elena. Steve. Or Seth. If you if you go onto the CMS.gov website where the they house all the webinars, Julie, is that one recorded and up and available now? I think it is, right? Yeah, and she'll also be presenting um, on the December webinar as well on Medicaid waivers. Oh, she will. Oh, excellent. Okay, so there you go. Another opportunity to hear her. So the one from September is recorded and on the CMS.gov website on our little area where we are, and then she's talking again in December. So that's awesome. Good. Good. Okay, and then we did some grant work at our annual meeting um, with Rebecca Drummond, and I am just kind of waiting uh, from her she was going to give she was going to be on the call I, I think there was a problem today and I don't think she's going to be on the call so um, we did spend quite a bit of time with Rebecca kind of thinking about um, you know some applications that we could do with the HRSA grant we had applied if you remember just about a year ago and it wasn't accepted but it was kind of a last minute thing and so those grants come up again like, we could probably get one for 2018. They're either development grants or they're grants that are used for actual, um, uh, you know, like one is more of a development and one you could actually get money for implementing things. So that's something that we spent quite a bit of time, you know, thinking about and talking about and, um, you know, getting some a budget for the Unite group so that we have 
you know, a way to kind of sustain what we're doing. So that, that may fit in to the piece if we choose for 2018 to talk about sustainability. Not, it, that may fit in with a grant, um, not so much for, for the tribal nursing home itself, but for what we're trying to do here to organize as a group of tribal nursing homes. We may be able to get some grant money to help us with that process. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind um, when we talk about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to the agenda. If I can find it, okay. Um, I have not heard anything from Randella Blue House with my COA. Um, she is on our list, sir. She gets these email invites. Um, if Joseph was on the call, he usually gives us updates on NCAI. Um, the GWEP, the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program, that grant continues through June 30th of next year. So I don't know how that's going to look. I'm not sure if they'll be around and be able to fund us for our annual meeting next year, so we just need to keep that in mind. They funded us a couple years now for a dinner, dinner meeting. Um, okay, so Lisa, I'm going to let you give a report for QIOs. Um, I guess in terms of what would be um, significant to share with this group or would be of interest to the UNITE group, um, one of the things that Melissa and Jordan and I are starting to kind of get a little traction on is um, creating... Um, some tools and resources around culture and care. I've got some um, feedback from my nursing homes in terms of uh, what kinds of things they'd like to see included. Jordan has been listening to the voice of the elder, so we're going to try and kind of meet in the middle and see what are the elders saying that we as uh, caregivers need to know and what are caregivers saying I need to know to take the best care of our patients, and I think what we're hoping to do is, uh, or my my thought anyways, is to come up with some sort of a kind of a template that we would create here in Alaska that might be useful for the nursing homes um, across Indian country, just to kind of identify what are some of those key components of culture for uh, caregivers that are important to know, you know, things like how do I assess pain or have... Uh, communicate about end of life, things like that. So we're just kind of in the baby steps. We've had a couple of meetings, Melissa and, and I have met this week, Jordan and I met this morning. So there's a lot more work ahead of us, but I think that at the, the end result might be something that this group would find useful and interesting. And Melissa, feel free to add in on that. Absolutely. Does anyone have any comments on that, what uh, Lisa just said? And if there, I know, go ahead. I was just going to say, if there's things that you think of that you would like to see or, you know, consider in this template, by all means, share those ideas with me. Yeah, I know that here, Lisa, we just got a small grant. That's why we're working with Rebecca Drummond on end-of-life services here on the nation. And, I mean, we used to have, well, you can comment on this. We used to have a program we called Desert Pathways which was hospice and palliative care, but the program kind of went away because of the staff, that we lost some staff that were basically running it. Um, I don't know, Lee, do you want to comment on end of life, what we did here? Well, it's, 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 you summed it up pretty well. We created a palliative care program um, and a hospice program. Uh, frankly, uh, the program probably could have continued if the, George, the, the board had the desire to do so. Um, I think they were um, really uncomfortable because they didn't see that as exactly within their mandate at the time. Um, but it was effective. We saw lots of tribal members in their homes and brought them into the skilled nursing facility for respite care when needed or, or, um, <clears throat> or intensive care during their time in hospice. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nothing. Uh-oh. Lisa, there's nothing with... Um, CMS regulating anything with end-of-life care, right, for nursing homes? That's not, like, looming on the horizon or anything. No, there's nothing in the, the new conditions of participation that 
speak specifically to this or the work that we're doing, I mean, in much more general terms of resident rights and that sort of thing. Okay. And, I mean, I don't know if this, you know, what, just what you said made me think about this might be a good clinical topic for the coming year with caregiver stress and things like that because we actually um, are using the reach into Indian country. I have sent that information out several times, but we have like 16 of our staff that are completing their certification in the REACH program uh, with Barbara Higgins at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. So that's a, I know, Lizzie, you did that. Did you get your certification? Yes. Uh, I'm actually working with a family. They're not um, Alaska Native and they're not remote, which is really where this program has the most um, application, but it gives me, I, I'm I'm going through the process with um, a local friend who's a care, caregiver for a mother-in-law. So um, it's given me an opportunity at least to apply the skills that I've learned. But it's a fantastic program, and I, Jordan and I talked about it at like this morning as well. Right. Because, I mean, when you think about that, it's I was just say the reason... What? I was just going to say, uh, if folks on the call are not aware about REACH, um, It'd be worth going to to point them to that program. We have talked about it, but I know we have some new people on the call, so I'm happy to send out the brochure again. My understanding is it ends in December, which means you got to kind of go quickly because it's a three-hour training, and then you do a one-hour kind of over the phone with Barbara demonstrating that you know how this works. So you get some really good printed materials and... Um, you know, it, it's all about supporting, really, the caregivers, and I think that that ties in really well to what you're saying with hospice and palliative care, too. Um, listening to the voice of the elders, I mean, that would all, I think, tie in really well. Is there anything else, Lisa, that you wanted to report on? No, that's it. Okay, um, thank you so much. Elizabeth Jose, did you want to say anything from the world of the ombudsman? No, I was just listening. Interesting, but not right now. Okay. Um, you know what? You were on. You were at the Banner Alzheimer's Institute Dementia and Native American Conference. Anything you want to mention from that? I did take some caregivers there, and I they really enjoyed it. And to use with their family members that they take care of, because I'm also the you know I'm also the family caregiver program coordinator. So that was very, very uh, interesting for for my caregivers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Do you feel like the elders were very, really receptive to the information? Yes. Yes, they were. And um, but we're still uh, because of our area, we have we just barely reached a few elders and caregivers. Yeah. So it's slowly, you know, going because there's a lot of uh, I've I've shared with the you know, with the the group that we need. Well, my my recommendation was expansion because of the the amount of people that are going in that direction. I'm seeing a lot of yeah, dementia on our nation. Yeah. So that will yeah. really help the expansion. But um, yeah. I I was at a elderly advisory committee meeting this past Monday. And Francis Stout and um, what was his name? Juan Casillas. Yeah. They were there sharing, so they brought up, up some of the stuff, some some of the issues that were there about the mm-hmm. uh, patient care. So okay. the elders heard heard that that. that what were some of the issues? Uh, about about uh, separating the Alzheimer's. Uh, Patients from the regular group, mm-hmm. like uh, assigning a separate wing for them, mm-hmm. because some of the issues that they they had was like the noise, for instance. They like I'm sorry, the what? The noise, like what okay. the room and all the the silverware and the dishes and you know all the residents, you know, commotion and everything. It mm-hmm. Uh, clients 
it's irritating to them, I think. Mm, I see. Mm-hmm. That, that, Are you familiar you know, with Debbie? Yeah, Elizabeth and I talked just really briefly about um, the Elder Advisory Committee. I mean, and she told me some of this uh, a couple of days ago. Um, mm-hmm. So I think working with our ombudsman is extremely important um, in terms of, you know, the changes that are happening and, you know, the information that's out there. I know that Banner Alzheimer's Institute, when we were at the conference, was really reaching out in their research arm um, because to look at, you know, to try to get tribes, you know, really engaged here with, you know, what's happening on their own tribe and, you know, planning and, and, you know, thinking ahead, that kind of thing. So I think Elizabeth and I had some ideas uh, to maybe, you know, facilitate that a little bit. Um, so thank you, Elizabeth. We always go back to I got to watch our time because we started a little bit late. But Julie, do you want to just mention some of the things we're working on with KAI? Um Yes, so uh, currently we are developing the um, the fourth uh, best practices report for the tribal nursing homes, and that the topic is emergency <clears throat> excuse me, emergency preparedness in tribal nursing homes. And so we were able to um, reach out to five um, homes and speak to the administrators about how their facility is preparing um, for emergency response or, and talk a little bit about their plans. Um, so we did reach out to um, Laguna Rainbow, Morning Star Care Center, Chinley um, Nursing Home, the Archie Hendricks, and then um, the Colville Convalescent Center. And so we'll be summarizing. Oh, you got to hold, hold, hold this, Sally Hatton? I did, yes. Good. Good. So, um, um, this is Lee. This is Lee. Does everyone know the emergency repairs rule was effective yesterday? Oh, yeah. Okay. Just so you're aware of it. I mean, Lee, do you want to just briefly mention? Um, I mean, it, it's just a change in the rules and regulations and the emergency preparedness requirements become effective, became effective yesterday. I'd have to go into the requirements, which everybody probably knows has a list of by now. Okay. Lisa, do you want to comment on that? Um, not much to say, except that it is um, a, a big requirement for nursing homes. And as Lee mentioned, it was there that's surveillable as of today. Right. Okay. There's lots of resources, and if anyone needs help, of course, you can reach out to me or any of your QIOs. We've got lots of stuff. Okay. I can tell you from our my perspective, because I've been working on this pretty closely, I've finished our hazard vulnerability assessment, communications plan, and updated our disaster plan, but there's still some pieces that, you know, are, are tricky to think through in terms of your evacuation plan. That was one that really, you know, getting everyone to really think what if, you know, you have to send everyone out somewhere, where are they going, and who's going with them, and who goes into which bands and where do those bands come from and what do they take with them and there's just a really a lot of pieces there when you talk evacuation that you need to think about. I know in Alaska for many of our facilities one of the challenges has been um, in supplies and in particular uh, potable water for your staff and your um, residents for I don't recall off the top of my head what the requirement is. I want to say, I'm, you know, however many gallons per person per day that you need to have. Um, wow. But for, for some of the remote communities, um, that can be very tricky. So I would just encourage folks to work with your community partners to help solve some of these problems because there are resources at that community level that um, nursing homes can connect with. Right. Okay, and we are doing drills. We do fire drills and lockdown drills. In fact, we just had a lockdown drill today. Um, so the drills are really important. Our understanding was to get the plans in place first and then schedule your tabletop. So we're looking at doing a tabletop exercise probably in January and then doing something in March where everyone gets involved, our police, our fire, Office of Emergency Management, everyone. 
but that you really need to have your plans in place before you can do that is my understanding. Um, all right, so um, let's move on. Julie, was there anything else? Um, I mentioned probably a few things. We still got obviously a problem with the calling number. Yes, so uh, CMS sets up the call-in number, so we will uh, need to circle back with John Johns about um, that call-in number. Okay. Otherwise, you'll be working with us and you'll be on our monthly call, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, all right. Anything else? And we're working on um, an email, an updated, complete updated email list, which, of course, is going to keep changing, but... Uh, we want to make it so that I have the ability, and actually, Melissa, you should have that too, that you have the ability to email us just like Julie would um, if we want to send out announcements or forward things. So we want to set that in place. Um, okay. Any, Lee, other than Lee, are there any administrators on this call today? Okay. Um, I don't know, Lee, is there anything else you wanted to say? I know you're not technically an administrator right now, but anything you'd like to share with the group? Actually, technically I am. It just doesn't have to be for a tribal nursing home at the minute. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you are good. Um, anything no, you need to read? If most if you get the names and addresses and put people on our listserv, I can get a lot of information out to everybody on a regular basis, which is the fastest way to do it. Okay. And I see deadlines are coming up for things like this emergency preparedness. I sent it out through the listserv pretty promptly. Okay. All right. Yep, we can share that. Julie, can we share the listserv that we have with Lee? Um, Debbie, the, the listserv is, is the master list that you have, so you, certainly you can share that. I can, I mean, I can download it and then send it out to Lee that can do that as well, yeah. I'd be happy to do it. The one that I work off of is, is a little more limited than the one I was feeding to Tony. So the one Tony had was probably even more current. That, that's why that's why with him leaving, Julie, I wanted to clarify that because you know he he had the, the most. He was what he was sending out was more current. When I send out the email to the T R E A C H, that's not as current as the one he was. Just so you know. Oh, um, okay. So Tony's got, yeah, he's got the most current list there. Um, I'm not sure where that is, but um, okay. Any directors of nursing on the call? Okay. Any board members on the call? Okay. Anyone had a recent survey that they'd like to share? All right. Any tribal assisted living facilities on the call? Uh, this right, is a complete sir. I, I missed most oh, of the call because I had trouble with the phone. I know. I had trouble, and I finally got on. So, Agnes, here's the thing. We we got started a little late because there was a trouble with the um, number, the normal call-in number. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to suggest, since we don't have a lot of time left, is that we mm -hmm. table our discussion um, on our next annual meeting and the topic starting in 2018 to our December call um, and our okay. next steering committee call, and that just give you some time now because I told them that you would be calling in. So if you could just kind of introduce yourself, and um, Agnes responded to some information we needed on disaster preparedness and did a wonderful job and has just been keeping in touch with this collaborative. So I'll let you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your background and that type of thing. And Debbie, I'm signing okay. off now, so I'll leave you to take the notes. Okay, okay. thank okay. you. And also, okay, the, yes. I'm sorry, I'm also, Agnes, I hope to catch up with you soon. Okay. All right, bye. Yep. And just, just okay, quickly, anyway, I just, um, oh, I just want to say real okay. quickly, the TJ call, the Tribal Technical Advisory Group call for the month of November was canceled, just so everyone knows, okay? So go ahead, Agnes. Okay. Anyway, I'm Agnes Sweetser. I am um, from the um, Athabasca and Loudoun tribe here in Galena, Alaska, a small community of only about 500. We're um, accessible only by air or, you know, snow machine, dog team, or in the summertime boat. Uh, we have the tribes from the nonprofit consortium, and we have a nine-unit elder-assisted living home. Uh, which we um, opened 
six years ago, six plus years ago. Um, we currently have two openings. We've, um, uh, and it's been a success. It was a humdinger to get off the ground, but we got it off the ground and our program is staffed by local, uh, tribal members that are CNAs or personal care assistants. Uh, I happen to have a master's in social work, but my background is in child protection for about 30 years. Um, and um, we have, on the day we were finally going to reach 100% capacity, the community flooded with the worst flood in over 100 years. Um, so our facility flooded. We had to evacuate, had to start all over because not only were we dealing with the stigma of assisted living, but we were dealing with now the fear of a disaster. Um, now we're back up and running uh, and just recently got two vacancies, one for a death and one for a medical transfer. Um, so that's kind of, it's it's been a challenge. I've learned a lot. Never thought I was going to do this. I should be retired. Um but we we didn't have enough money to pay anybody. Now we do. So if you guys know of anybody who's looking for an exciting uh, opportunity, we do have an administrator's job out here. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it. And I'm I'm happy to share, you know, what we have learned and our experiences in opening up a a home. Um, you know, that's not accessible really. Um, and from the ground up, with almost total ignorance, I do have some education, so I know how to learn. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been wonderful. Wow, that's interesting. So, where is your when you had the disaster and the flooding? Where did you evacuate people to? It all had to be air vac then, or how did that? Work? We, they had to be air vac. First, we had to evacuate them out of our facility. Um, you know, by van, of course, and I did that. And the one thing I didn't allow for was that our property is much higher than the roads, so I almost got us stuck in there because I didn't allow for the roads to be washed out. Anyway, we got out and evacuated them to the local shelter, which is the school, and then from there they were boated to the airport and put on planes um, and then put in a shelter in Fairbanks, you know, the nearest city, uh, and we had to keep staff on duty to take care of our residents, even though we were closed down. And FEMA promised to pay for that, but they still haven't, uh, and I doubt that they will. Um, so that was a lesson. When was that? When was that? When was that? 19, uh, 20, 2013. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you got no federal aid at all? Uh, we had a big battle because we we got in, we had recovered by insurance and they wanted to consider us a residence and not a business. And I had to fight extremely hard to get a half a million dollar claim. Um, you know, we were totally flooded. Our whole f building was flooded. Uh, up to one foot and it settled at four inches for a week. So, you know, all of the flooring, everything had to be redone. Um, uh. And finally won the, won the battle because I had let some people use the facility to have community meetings and trainings and various things when we were trying to get going. I was renting training space, you know, to draw in some income. And that's what saved our bacon. Wow. We, we wow. had and a expectation that we were more than a... Pardon? No, go ahead. I, I don't know what I was going to say. Like I said, I should be retired, and 95% of our residents have dementia, and I think it's contagious by osmosis. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any questions for Agnes or any comments? Yeah. 
when when you took people to Fairbanks, did you send staff with them? That's what I wanted to ask. Yes, yes, we did. We uh, and you know that just about broke the budget because we were paying overtime. And yeah, and it did. Yeah, the those, HR those that could be. Late. Those that could be taken care of by family, of course, weren't the issue, but not when everybody else's home was being flooded and they had kids and grandkids to take care of, they couldn't handle the needs of someone in assisted living. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so those are some really good points. And you had a disaster plan, right, Agnes? Yeah, mm -hmm. and we practiced it, you know, because they were anticipating it might flood. So I thought, well, we better practice and educate everybody and get everything ready, you know, and pack up everything and all those things that, you know, are required and then some. Um, yeah, I guess the thing I didn't uh, plan for was the staffing that, um, you know, what that would entail, you know, uh, a week is a lot more than just a couple of days paying overtime. Right. And they all went to, you had to pay for all the airfare and all that to get them to Fairbanks? No, no, no. The state and FEMA put that bill. Okay. It was just the care, the special care. Mm hmm Okay. All right. Well, I would like to hear more on that. Would you be willing, Agnes, to share your disaster plan? I don't know if you could just give us the, you know, if you need to take parts out, but I think it might be helpful, especially for some of our assisted living, to see what you put together. Because from what you said in your email to me, I mean, it sounded like you were pretty well prepared, and I do appreciate that. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we were. Just, I don't know. I don't know how that happened, but. Because I've been through a lot of floods, I guess, so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was just a fiscal piece, but we've recovered. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any other questions for Agnes? Okay. So, um, let's, we're going to plan that we're going to go ahead and, and, and finish this call because 1 o'clock is our stop time. At least it's 1 o'clock here. Um, our next. Our steering committee call, for those of you on the steering committee, is Monday, December 11th. And the next Unite call will be the 20th of December, which I realize is getting kind of close to Christmas. But let's see if we can all be on the call, because I think we really do need to talk about 2018 and what direction we want to head. So uh, think about a clinical and non-clinical topic for 2018. Um, that you could commit to and also to where we want to have our annual meeting and just kind of review the minutes um, that were sent out from our annual meeting because some of that's on there too. Okay? Anybody else join the call that I need to add to the attendance other than Agnes? Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you all for being on the call. Appreciate your time.